Hello and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. You're seriously going to want to get out your Bible. I'm going to be showing you stuff just blowing your mind. Um, and I mean, we're looking at this April 8th um, solar eclipse, the great American eclipse. I haven't seen this much excitement about the possibility for the rapture since um, Hanukkah in this, this past year because of stuff that was supposed to be going on at the UN. Before that, it was the ninth of Av. Well, Rosh Hashanah, of course, but before that, it was the ninth of Av. Oh my goodness, seven years ago, when the first solar eclipse went, everybody's going gaga over that, and they're just flipped out over it. And ten years ago, with the blood moon tetrads, oh my goodness, we were sure we were going to get raptured then. If I only knew today what I knew back then. Um, so bold predictions. I've got two of them. And first of all, they are predictions. They are not prophecies. I am not a prophet. I don't prophesize. I teach. I have two bold predictions. Number one, April 8th is not the rapture. And number two, everybody, just about, I can't say, whenever you say everybody, it's not always everybody, just the majority. The majority of the people who are now saying April 8th is not the rapture will be wrong. And then they will say Pentecost. And they're going to be wrong, too. In fact, with Pentecost, they're even going to have the wrong day. How do I know that? Because people are already pointing to Pentecost based on this eclipse. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at all these things. But based on this eclipse and a few verses they pick out here and there and whatever, because it just supports what they want to say, they're pointing now to the rapture happening on Pentecost. And they have the wrong day. The day that they're saying is Pentecost is not Pentecost. Mm. We're going to look at some serious, serious biblical gymnastics that somebody has done trying to tell us that the scripture says that the rapture will happen on Pentecost. This is actually funny. Um <laughs> Of course, we're going to look at why the rapture is not going to happen on April 8th. I've got a lot of verses about the eclipses that are in Scripture that we will look at. We're going to look at those last, including the two. There's two, to me, two eclipses that are that you can see that's going to occur that are the ones that we need to be looking at, and nobody's looking at those at this point. Well, I'm somebody, and I'm looking at them, and I'm sure there's other people out there looking at them because I've said it before. But I don't. When I look at when I scroll through some of these Facebook groups or I look at things, I'm not seeing anybody talking about these. I actually also found another set of blood moon tetrads coming up. But those blood moon tetrads, they're out into the future, and to me, it would be after tribulation. And I don't take them serious because during tribulation, oh my goodness, a lot's going to happen to the star, to the sun, to the moon, and all these things. And, and the calendar is going to probably go back to a 360-day calendar. So I don't think we're going to really know what the eclipses will be like then. So I'm not really looking at those. So let's go ahead and get started. What have I been saying about these eclipses? What have I been saying? What I've been saying is that it's not the rapture, and it could be judgment against America, against the West. It At most, it could be, is what I've said. All right? So I want to look at why it could be judgment. Why does a solar eclipse possibly mean judgment against the, the Gentile nations? And that's because in the Talmud, it talks about that it is, that signs in the moon are about Israel and signs in the sun are about the Gentile world. So I thought I would get in and take a look at what does the Talmud actually say? It was, it, this is actually going to be really funny when we see what the Talmud says. It's, it's like, oh, wow, really? That's what it says? I mean, that was kind of my reaction. All right, but before we get into that, what is the Talmud, and which one? 
What do you mean, which one? Well, there are two. There's the Babylonian Talmud, and there's the Jerusalem Talmud. And to be honest, I don't know which one this is written in. Um, when Israel was taken off to Babylon for 70 years, there was a um, Babylonian Talmud. And the Talmud is just the writings of men, the opinions of the rabbis, of the priests, of the Sadducees, of the Pharisees, of anybody that we was writing, you know, somebody was considered in power. And we know, by the way, Messiah dealt with them that they had some issues. There was no problem with the law or the Bible or scripture that Messiah wrote. It was how it was being interpreted. Let's show that real quick. All right, go with me. This is going to be a video I'm just going to take my time with. Hope you don't mind. Let's go to Isaiah 56. Yeah, get your Bibles out. Isaiah 56. And actually, the first part of this. Am I in the right place? I am not. Oh, I hate when I do. Or, you know, I'm in the right place. I'm in the wrong version. No wonder it didn't look right. I like the new King James Version. The beginning of this talks about salvation for the Gentiles and about how we're going to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to be doing offerings and all of this. And Isaiah spoke about this 700 years before Messiah was there. But he has this prophecy about the irresponsible leaders of Israel. All you feast in the uh, beast of the field, come and devour. All you beast in the force. In other words, the... People who are the spiritual leaders of Israel aren't doing their job so that they are leaving Israel wide open to attacks from the enemy. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are dumb dogs. Wait, wait, I got to defend dogs. Let's look at that word dogs here because my dog is not dumb. Furthest from it. The dogs here. Figuratively, a male cult prostitute. My dog is not a male cult prostitute. But what that means is basically they that the Pharisees and the leaders, the watchmen, had sold themselves out to Rome, to everything else. They were looking out for their own interests, not for the interest of Israel. Okay, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. They're not warning people. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs, um, which are which never have enough. They are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone to his own gain. From his own territory. Come, one says, I'll bring the wine. And we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink, and tomorrow will be as today, and much more abundant. See, they were bad shepherds, and Messiah came as the good shepherd. All right. So these are, these are the people that the Talmud are the teachings of, okay? We also see this in Scripture um, in Matthew 15. Messiah mentions this. And this is talking about the Talmud. Matthew 15, verse 9. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Okay, so, and this is what he's basically, he's throwing out a scripture from Isaiah, and we're going to look at that in a minute. And he is condemning the Pharisees, the teachers of Israel, saying that this is what they're doing. They're falling into the prey, or they're falling into the prophecy that Isaiah gave. Actually, today, in most synagogues, they teach the commandments of men. I had a conversation. I, I mentioned before that one of the places I work has a uh, Jewish congregation that's Orthodox Jews. And a conversation with the lead rabbi, and he was shocked to find out that I'm eating biblically clean. I'm doing, I don't work on the Sabbath. Um, anyhow, when I asked him if what he taught from, do you teach from Torah and the prophets or the Talmud? And um, he said from the Talmud, he said, don't, don't you think that that might be the commandments of men that Isaiah warned about? He says, I don't think so. I, I said, I couldn't imagine it, but you're kind of teaching the commandments of men. 
I have a relationship with him. We can have these conversations. You're just amazed that a follower of Yeshua, of Messiah, understands the Old Testament the way I do. Anyhow, so let's see what Isaiah had to say. It's back in Isaiah 29. By the way, um, when we get into the beginning of in our Matthew Bible study, we just talked about the, or about to talk about, I don't know, I've got a couple reported ahead of time. And I'm going to keep doing that Bible study till the very end. And then we'll pick another book if we're still here. Um, we're in Matthew, in, um, I'm sorry, Matthew 12, which is the abom abomination, no, we're not, abomination, desolation, no, 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 no. The unpardonable sin which was Israel corporately rejecting Messiah. And when we get into Matthew 13, Messiah is going to basically tell us that all of the church and all of the synagogues are going to be full of leaven, be full of pagan idolatry, of false teaching by the time he comes back. And that's really cool when you put those, those uh, parables together. But anyhow, Isaiah 29 13 and 14. Therefore, the Lord says, so this is straight from Messiah, insomuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts from me. Messiah wants your heart. He doesn't want lip service. He wants your heart. They have removed their hearts far from me. And their fear towards me is taught by the commandment of men. Hmm. What's the fear of the Lord supposed to be taught from? We'll, talk, we'll, we'll go there. Why not? Um, therefore, behold. Okay, let's go back. Let's do fear Lord beginning. Which one do I want to go to? Well, look at Psalm 110, or 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom would be good. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments and praise and praise endures forever. So that's the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. That's where it starts. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wis of knowledge. But fools, despite wisdom and, and instruction, I'm curious what word they use here for instruction. Eh. No, it's not. But Torah is instruction. The word Torah means instruction. So anyhow, these are the people that are writing the Talmud. Now let's look and see what they had to say. Here it is. This is a Hebrew advance, advancing Jewish thought mosaic, what the Talmud says about solar eclipses and how rationalist rabbis explained it. Okay, so this guy is, this is an article done by somebody who looked through all the things in the Talmud. He's going to tell us what was said. Surprisingly, giving its near boundless breadth of, and the ancient rabbi's interest in astral phenomenon, the Talmud contains only a single discussion of solar eclipses found in the tactical sukha gil student um, summarizes the passage and explains how medieval and modern rabbis address the problem it raises the, the first opinion is that solar eclipses are a bad omen for the whole world this is what we people have been talking about another opinion is that they're a bad omen for the gentiles while lunar eclipses are a bad omen for the Jews. This is what I've always understood. Apparently, because the Jewish calendar is lunar, while the Gentile calendar is solander, additionally, the Talmud states that there are four things that cause solar eclipses. So here are the causes of our solar eclipses, according to these ancient Jewish writings. A deceased chief judge who is eulogized insufficiently. A betrothed woman who was assaulted and not rescued homosexual relations, and twin brothers killed at the same time. Granted, understand, these are commandments of men. 
Rabbi, that guy in the 1500s, asked how the stages can be attributed reasons to a solar eclipse, which is a natural occurrence. Whether, he, whether or not people sin, the solar eclipses will happen. He quotes earlier sources that interpret this passage allegorically. Rabbi Isaac ben Moses Arama, Arama in the 1400s explains that the Talmud really refers to the death of religious a right, of the righteous when those who are the source of light suddenly go dark. Taking a different approach, Rabbi Judah Lel of Prague in 1600 explains that the Talmud is offering reasons why God established nature in such a way that there would be solar eclipses. If people did not sin, we would not we would merit eternal life. However, because God knew people would sin, he created the world so that the solar eclipses would happen. Thus, the Talmud is not offering the reason for solar eclipses, which is natural phenomena, but behind the reason why nature is the way it is. This rabbi, Jonathan, yeah, that's his name, uh, late 1600s into 1700s, who was quite aware of and impressed by scientific discoveries of his day, suggests that the Talmud not, um, I'm sorry, the Talmud referring not to eclipses, but to sunspots. While solar eclipses can be predicted, sunspots cannot because they are caused by sin. Okay. There is your reasoning for eclipses being judgment. All right. Again, that's why I've said at most, and I'm not convinced that the Talmud is correct, Messiah, but it heads with people that were teaching the commandments of men. He did not, but heads with him over everything they said, just the ones that contradicted scripture. And I'll leave it at that. Um, so no rapture. Um, April 8th is not. April 8th is not an appointed time on the calendar, period. Some people have tried to say that God changed the calendar and made it, uh, and that it's Rosh Hashanah. Um, April 8th is the first of a month. Okay. So let's just go, and we're going to go real quick through the verse that they say. Exodus 12. I know I've done this so many times. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, The month shall be the beginning of months. This shall be, I'm sorry, this month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to the congregation of Israel on the tenth of every month. Each man shall take for himself a lamb. That's Passover. Go quickly to Leviticus 23. So he's saying Passover is the first month of the year. It's a new calendar that was added. Leviticus 23, where does Passover occur? On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So it's in its correct place in the first month. Rosh Hashanah, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest. A memorial blowing of trumpets is in its correct month. Anything before Exodus 12, like it's things in Genesis, if it says a, a month of the year, you need to adjust because he just changed where the beginning of month started. He added another calendar. He didn't really change anything. He just added a new calendar. There are two calendars, a civil calendar and a religious calendar. The religious calendar starts on... Uh, what we know today as Nisan, in the civil calendar, starts on Tishri, Rosh Hashanah. All right. Um, when did Paul say the last the, the rapture would occur? At the last trumpet? We just did a video about trumpets not long ago. But one of the things that we showed is that... Oh, I thought I had it up here. Give me a second. No, here it is. Shavuot, Pentecost. The first trumpet occurred on Shavuot and get the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. This is the first trumpet. There are three named trumpets. The first trumpet is blown on Rosh Hashanah. The last trump is the 
is blown on, I'm sorry, the first trump is blown on Shabuot, the last trump on Rosh Hashanah, and the um, the great trumpet is on Yom Kippur. We just did a video about that. See, the last trumpet is the Tekiah. Dahlia. And real quick. Anyhow, if you, the last trump is the Takiya Gedalia, and it is blown on Rosh Hashanah. The horn blown on Rosh Hashanah. And this is Shabbat.org. It's a Jewish um, website that, that teaches about things like that. So the rapture is not going to happen there. So now, one of the things that I've seen is that this is a warning of judgment. Oh my goodness, look at all the Nineveh cities that it goes through. And what they do is they tell us, they, they, in Nineveh, in, excuse me, in the book of Jonah, it tells us that judgment, that everybody's going to get wiped out in 40 days. And if you take the 40 days from April 8th, it takes you to Passover. Excuse me. I said that wrong. Let me repeat that. If you take the 40 days from April 8th, it takes you to Pentecost. And that's going to be the rapture. We have a problem with that. Let's look something up real quick. Pentecost 2024 occurs on May 19th. Write that down somewhere or keep it in your mind. May 19th. What else is this day known as from a Jewish standpoint? It's known as Shavuot. So let's look at Shavuot 2024. June 11th. How can these two days be that far off? Bottom line. The church counts Passover as 50 days from Easter, or Ishtar, if you understand what I'm saying. And those Easter egg, they're disgusting. No, not the actual eggs our children paint, but the origins of it. If, if you knew, you would never have your kids paint an Easter egg. If you understood what that represents, I'll leave it at that. Look it up. You can do your own research. Shabbat is 50 days from Passover. It's the counting of the Omar. It should be this date, June 11th through June 13th, but everybody's going to be out there thinking it's May 19th because people are telling them that. So let's look at the book of Jonah. Why would people think this? How would you go from saying that this eclipse is Part of um, this eclipse is pointing to the rapture on Pentecost. One of the things, and I don't have it to show you or reference to you that I had saw, is that the, the story goes like this. There is a notable, and you may have seen this, a notable like um, biblical historian who has hypothesized that there was an eclipse when Jonah went through Nineveh. Hypothesize. It doesn't say it has a proof. I can hypothesize that last night I won the huge million, uh, mega millions lottery. I can hypothesize that as long as I want. But until I check my tickets and find out whether or not I did, I probably do. But until I do, it's just a hypothesis. It's not provable, but it's written as if it's fact. People do this all the time. Um, Big Bang Theory. It could have. It may have. That's the science behind a Big Bang Theory. Anyhow, let's go back. By the way, if God spoke and everything came into existence, my goodness, is that going to make a Big Bang? Let's go on. All right, so let's go to Jonah and look at a couple of verses. Uh, where do we want to go? Jonah 3, 4. 
And we still got a lot of scripture to get to, guys. So I'm done with this. I'm done with this. And we're just back to the Bible. Jonah. Still got that veggie song in my head. Jonah was a prophet. Yeah, yeah. But he never got it. Yeah, yeah. And Jonah began to uh, began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and none of us shall be overthrown. So in forty days, judgment's going to come that's going to wipe everybody out if they don't repent. You know the story. None of it, I mean, Jonah didn't want them to repent. He wanted God to wipe them out. But what time of the year did this happen in? Does this, does this Bible tell us anything about what time of the year this was? Yeah, it does, if you know what you're reading. Um, let me ask you this. God coming and wiping out everybody, indiscriminate judgment, wiping out everybody. Is that a picture of the rapture, or is that a picture of Armageddon? It's a picture of Armageddon, not the rapture. What? Okay, the rapture is Rosh Hashanah. What feast day is Armageddon? Yom Kippur. What's the next feast day? Tabernacles, the millennial kingdom. Go with me to Jonah 4, 5. You probably know the story. Jonah built a little shelter. God made a plant come up. And then God made a, um, he made a little, himself a little shelter and he sat under it. Under the shade, um, God made a little plant grow up. Then he made a worm that ate the plant. What shelter? What is that word shelter? Let's take a look. A booth. The word is sukkah. This is sukkahs, booths, tabernacles. This represents the millennial kingdom. Keep in mind that it's the, the um, give me a minute. My spelling is going to probably show up. No, I spelled none of it wrong. I can't spell. Give me a second here. I'm going to show you something. I just wanted to come to this verse in Matthew 12. The men, men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. In other words, that generation rejected Messiah. But these people who actually um, repented, they're going to be in the millennial kingdom. That's the reference to the millennial kingdom here. It is not to the rapture. Um, so in this story in Jonah, we have no reference to the rapture, to an eclipse, or even to Shavuot, which is we call Pentecost. And it's just 50 days, Penta, 50. There's no reference to it. So, but, so people said, saw so all these men of the cities, and they're trying to make something out of it. And sometimes people do these, what I like to call biblical gymnastics to get somewhere that is just ridiculous. And I'm going to pull up my phone. I, I took a screenshot of something I saw on Facebook. And I want to, I'm going to talk about what this says. And then we're going to look at it through scripture and to see whether or not it is feasible. And when you start getting into these kinds of like number things, it's just like, you've got to be kidding me. The, 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 um, it points to a verse. Oh, before we go there, I want to go someplace else in Jonah. I almost forgot something. When we start off in Jonah, we do see two things that are very important and that do have biblical implications for the end times. Um, Jonah entered the city and on the first day's walk, he carried, oh, let's start. It was a, now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey. Three days, Messiah arose on the third day. This is one of our sods. 2,000 years, third day, millennial kingdom started. Okay, you see it again. 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 
40 times a year of Jubilee, 50, 2,000 years. These are things that tell us that Messiah will come back, feet on the ground, 2,000 years from when he, when he left. That would be Armageddon when he comes back, which is what this story points to, not for the rapture. Anyhow, the mental gymnastic, oh my goodness. So it takes this verse, Jonah 3, 4, talking about the 40 days, okay? Um, and how it, it has about Nineveh, and that's what it connects it to this eclipse. And then it goes to Daniel 8. You know what? I could see myself have believing this back in the day because I wouldn't have gone and looked through all this stuff. I wouldn't have known how to do it. But it goes to Daniel 8, 19. Which just says, and look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of indignation. For the appointed time, the end shall be. So they take the name Daniel, and they get the Strong's number. And then they take the number here, or appointed time, and give the Strong's number. So they say it's Daniel is 1840, and the appointed time number is 2165. And together, you add them together, and you get 4,005, which means Pentecost. Therefore, the rapture happens at Pentecost. That's the teaching. Understand that wrongs came about a lot later, and I don't think you can do um, numerical gymnastics using Strong's numbers, because you could point things all over the place just by picking whatever scripture you wanted to do it. This guy, did, it looks impressive. When I look at the post, it looks impressive. I could see how somebody would, would say, oh, wow, that is so cool. There are problems with this. Okay, first of all, let's go here and look at this word for appointed time, which he says is Strong's 2165. But this says it's Strong's 4150. And what is this word, Moed? So the word appointed time here is appointed time, appointed, um, appointed place, appointed time, appointed time. This is the Moed. These are the feast days, the appointed times of the Lord, which Messiah was crucified on Passover. His body was in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He arose on the Feast of First Fruits, and the Holy Spirit came down in Shava Oats. The rapture will be on Rosh Hashanah, the, um, on atonements or Yom Kippur is Armageddon when Messiah returns, and the Tabernacles or Sukkot is the Millennial Kingdom. These are all of them, but he's trying to tell us it's a specific number, and his number is wrong. He quoting this verse. The number he gave us was for appointed time just two one six five. Actually, I've got to put in an H. H2165. Zaman. We're going to look at it in Ecclesiastes. This is season. You know this verse. If you're an old timer and you like some of the, the 60s music, you know the birds and for everything there's a season. Turn, turn, turn. To everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, etc. It goes down and down and down. That word time, or a, that word season, there's a season for everything. Zaman, the 2165, is a set time, an appointed time. This is not telling you Pentecost. Now, he took these numbers, if, if from the verses that he used, using Daniel at 1840, and the appointed time that shows up in uh, Daniel 8, which is actually, what was the number we had for that? Uh, 4150, it comes up with the Hebrew name number H, or the Hebrew word H, 5990. That would be the correct math based on the scriptures he gave us. Mm -hmm. 
do I need to comment on this? I don't think I do. Be careful what you read when somebody tells you what something is. Um, again, the last trumpet is Rosh Hashanah, not Pentecost. So now I want to go and look at some of the scriptures that are being used to tell you that this is the rapture or this is judgment or pointing to it. And just let's look at scriptures about, about um, eclipses. The first one that people point to is Genesis 1.14. Genesis 1.14 is the third day. Excuse me, the, four, the fourth day. Let me ask you this. How many human beings are there on earth at this point? How many Jews are there on earth at this point? Zero. There is nobody on earth at this point. No human being. And God said, let the lights in the firmament, or let there be lights in the firmament to divide heaven. I'm sorry. I'm not reading correctly. Let me, another sip of coffee. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth. And so it was. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So people take this, it's for seasons, and they try to make it for any time that they want. Does this say anything about eclipses? No. What is the word season here? Moed. These are appointed times. So before there was ever a human being or a Jew on the earth, God set up and ordained the appointed times of the Lord that are found in Leviticus 23. They're not Jewish. What's interesting here is this word, and we're going to see it in a little bit. They are for signs and seasons. See this word signs? Oh, I just want you to look at the definition. A sign, a signet, a distinguishing mark, a banner. Keep that word in mind. A banner. This is like a rallying point, okay, when you look at this stuff. And we're going to see it show up because this, too, appoints to, talks about when Messiah comes back. It, this is what the sun and the sign, the sun and the moon are. It points to the appointed days of the Lord. And the appointed days of the Lord point to when our Messiah comes back. All right, so I got to go one other place real quick, and I'm going to have to pause to get there because I didn't write down this verse. So give me a second. Here's another verse that people are using about these eclipses. And then it will be, if you do not believe, if they do not believe you, or nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. If they didn't believe the first eclipse seven years ago, they're going to believe the eclipse on the second time now that we're seeing now. What's the context? Context is king. Let's look at this verse. Let's put it in context. Um, Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to me. This is the calling of Moses. Or listen to, to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and, and take it by the tail. He reached out and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers the Abraham of, I'm sorry, of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put it, his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, 
nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. Does this have anything to do with eclipses? Does this have anything to do with the rapture? No. They took this verse and tried to twist it to, to, to fit what they want to say of their eclipses. It's not how you look at Scripture. You read Scripture to see what it says. You don't read Scripture to pick out verses to try to support what you want to say. And that's what people are doing. All right, let's go and look at some other verses about the rapture. Here's another one that people keep using. Mark 13, 24. Uh, excuse me, verses about eclipses. The people, I keep seeing this verse show up. Mark 13. Let's just read verse 24 by itself first, and then we'll give it some context. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give up its light. After tribulation. I don't have to look for 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 any other context. This is not the rapture. This is after tribulation. Hmm. We see the same thing in Matthew 24. Verse 29. And immediately after tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give up its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Not it. Okay, you actually have something going here. Um, and does not give... I'm not going to bother with it. That's a rabbit trail I don't need to get down. All right, so this doesn't work. Period. Okay, let's go to Joel 2. Hmm, yeah, Joel 2. I'm just looking at the order I have here. Let's start in verse 10. Um, if you understand Joel, here's your rapture right here, blow an alarm a trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. That means it's there. The day of the Lord is starting. This is Rosh Hashanah. They're blowing trumpets. Um, sound an alarm. There are armies coming, Psalm 83. And you start reading through here. Oh, my goodness, this is tribulation. So in verse 10, the earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble, and the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. This is this is a uh, most likely a solar and lunar eclipse. It could just be that there's so much war and nuclear stuff going on that it is shaving everything out. Could be. I believe it's eclipses in the middle of tribulation. It goes down again in verse 23. Is it uh, 31? The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, the great and awesome day of the Lord, is that the rapture? I don't think so. Because Elijah, let's go to Malachi 4. Verse, Malachi 4, verse 5. And we see that, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the children to the, uh, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Least I come and strike the earth with a curse. We know that John the Baptist would have been Elijah. But in the end times, and when does Elijah come? Elijah is one of the two witnesses. Does he come before the rapture? No. He's in the first half of tribulation. He comes before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is the beginning of the great tribulation. I hope that makes sense. Um, at least I come and strike the earth with a curse. What do the two witnesses do? They strike the earth with all kinds of curses. 
let's go to Isaiah 13, verse 10. Or actually, we're going to start in verse 1. But Isaiah 13. The burden against Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Omar, saw. Understand there are lots of dual prophecies. And the the um, Judea being carried off to Babylon has a lot of um, dual prophecies with the end days, end times. Um, it really does. But anyhow, lift a banner on a high mountain. Raise your voice to them. Wave your hand that you may enter the gates with the nobles. Remember that word banner we saw in Genesis 1-4? Okay, this is not the same Hebrew word, but the other Hebrew word has this as a definition. This word, banner, and it'll give you an idea of when this is happening or the relative time frame, also shows up, and it's a, Something lifted up, a standard, a signal, signal pole, insignia, uh, banner, sign, very similar to the other word we looked at, shows up in Isaiah 11. So let's look at Isaiah 11. In that day, in that day, the last thousand years, starting with the rapture and tribulation, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, that's Messiah, who shall stand as a banner for his people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand a second time and recover the remnant of his people who are left. And when you look at those places, that's just north, south, east, west. This is setting up the millennial kingdom where Messiah brings everybody back from the four corners of earth and the four corners of, of heaven, and they're all in Israel. Not everybody, just those that belong to him. These will be the children of Israel with him as he reigns on the throne in Jerusalem. Um, so let's go back to where we were at. I just want to give you some context as to when this is talking about. Eh, can I get back there this way? Sure can. I have, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have called my sanctified ones. Ah, okay, let me keep going. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exaltation. The noise of the multitude in the mountains, like you have, like that of, of many peoples, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. This is Armageddon and all the nations gathered against Messiah. The Lord of hosts, that's this is an end times prophecy because host it, the Lord of hosts, host is a military commander. This is Messiah coming back as a military commander. We see this in places. It doesn't necessarily mean Armageddon, but it's connecting that time frame. The Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. Oh, this is talking about Armageddon. They have come from a far country, from the far uh, from the ends of heaven. The Lord and his weapons of indignation, that's wrath, to destroy the whole land. Well, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It's here. And it will come as a it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore the hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt. Ooh. Interesting. This is very similar to the reading that we see at the midpoint of tribulation where Israel is saved out of tribulation for the time of Jacob's trouble, which is Jeremiah 30. You might want to go and take a look. And they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. Birth pains, that's tribulation. We'll see you see that in Jeremiah 30. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes rule with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. That's not the beginning of tribulation. Messiah doesn't come with his wrath until later. And he will destroy it. Okay, all of the judgments of, of tribulation are from Messiah. They all are. But his wrath, his 
fierce anger destroying everything, that's near the end. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give its light. The sun will be darkened and it's going and it's going forth and the moon will not cause light to shine. Is this before tribulation? No, it's not. All right. So that's the verses I have that have been used to try to say that the rapture is connected to this eclipse and giving you verses of what scripture does say about eclipses. Now, here's the interesting thing. As you know, I've been teaching, I believe, from some of the timelines I've been doing, looking at all the different scriptures, that there's a very good chance the rapture could be this year on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah being the only day that it can happen on. If you don't get that, you need to study the feast days. You need to study Rosh Hashanah. And I've done video after video on the names and the themes of Rosh Hashanah that scream rapture. But if it's going to happen this year on Rosh Hashanah in 2024, the midpoint of tribulation would be 2028. So you would expect to find a lunar and a solar eclipse before the midpoint of tribulation in 20 on near near Passover in 2028. So near the spring, sometime before the spring of 2028, they're there. These are the eclipses I think we should be looking at, in my opinion. And what's going on at this point? Actually, what I would Google here is just time and date. Eclipses. Okay. So what would be, what would I look for? I mean, what's going on at the midpoint of tribulation? This is the midpoint of tribulation is where Israel says that that's where they come back and they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is where Israel in Jeremiah 30 is saved out of tribulation. Okay. So, would it make sense that these eclipses would be visible in Israel? So, let's look. What do we have in 2028? All you have to do is go over in here and type in a year. Right here, January 11th, 12th, there is a lunar eclipse. And it's pretty much the whole moon. And if you look here, it is will be fully visible in Israel. But we're not going to find a eclipse, a solar eclipse in Israel this year, that year. So let's look at 2027. And we're looking for a solar eclipse. And here it is in August. Hmm. Give me a second. No wonder I'm confused. I'm looking at the wrong eclipse. August 2nd, this solar eclipse here. Where is it visible? Nope, I didn't mean to do that, but you'll see how the eclipse comes about. And it will be visible in Israel. It passes through Israel. What's really interesting to me is this date. You can see right there, the solar eclipse is visible in Israel. Because August 2nd, 2027. Do you know what? Are you guys familiar with Tisha B'Av? or the 9th of Av, 2027, what's the date? The 9th of Av is the, now August 2nd is our clip. The 9th of Av is believed to be when they said, uh -uh, we're not going in there, there's giants in the land. Um, it's the date that both temples fell. It is the date of the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, there's a list this long. When you say 9th of Bob, they're like, oh, it's the saddest day of the year. 
a huge list of things that have happened on that date. It's a fast date, a man-made fast date for that day. But it doesn't, but it's not just one day. Oh, excuse me, my apologies. It's not just one day. It's these between the straits, and that's the phrase that you'll get. Um, between the straits is at the first temple. It goes from when the wall was breached till three weeks later when the temple was, was destroyed. They know the time as between the straits. The saddest time. This is like this. If you've ever heard the phrase in dire straits, that's where that phrase comes from. So this and Bishop Yab is on August 12th and 13th. I think it's very interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, 27, 11th and 12th, same basic time. But so the second, which is when that eclipse will be, is during during that time, during the between the straits or the um, in dire straits time. I find that very interesting. This has always been a personal belief of mine, not something I can say from scripture, that if the rapture is going to happen a given year, something will happen negative towards Israel on that day. Anyhow, so you can see that it's August 12th and 13th for 2024. Anyhow, I, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I know this was a longer video, but I just wanted to give you as much de detail as I could. Um, and again, my bold predictions, the rapture is not on April 8th. That the people that are now saying that the rapture is April 8th will change their tune to and join the other people to say that that eclipse points to Pentecost. And the third prediction, the rapture is not going to be on Pentecost because they've even got the wrong day. It's not Shavuot. Pentecost is 50 days from Easter. Shavuot, the true Pentecost, is 50 days from Passover. Anyhow, thank you guys for watching. God bless you.